Need Bitcoin support? The pros at Coinbase Connect are here to help. Learn about self-custody, privacy, mining, lightning payments, and much more. Simply go to coinbeast.com backslash connect and schedule a one-on-one video call with a Bitcoin pro. Take your knowledge to the next level by connecting with a pro on coinbeast.com today. Please check out episode 41 with Adam O, aka Denver Bitcoin on Twitter, episode 46 with Hoddle Tarantula, or episode 49 with Adam Meister. All our pros you can connect with at coinbeast.com connect today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Chris Salamo, and I am an amateur investor. This podcast is my open source journal of everything I learn about investing and wealth management. I'm here to explore the key concepts, market dynamics, and investing strategies that will assist you on the path towards financial independence and financial literacy. My mission is to build us from amateurs to experts. All suggestions are my own, and I recommend that you should do your own research before taking any investment advice. See you in this week's episode. I hope you enjoy it. All right. Welcome to the show. This is episode 59 of the Amateur Investors. In this episode, I'm going to be interviewing the one and only uh, Guy Swan, uh, host of Bitcoin Audible and Shitcoin Insider, the guy who's read more about Bitcoin than anyone else you know, uh, the guy that literally needs no introduction among Bitcoiners, Guy Swan. Thanks for coming on the show, Guy. What's up, man? Good to be here, dude. Good to do it. I, I know I got to meet you at the Tab Conference back in November. That was a great conference. It was my first one. I, I miss Bitblock Boom. And oh, that was the, your first one. Oh, no. Yeah, so I, I miss Bitblock Boom and the Bitcoin Conference uh, because it just had my buddy's wedding. So, you know, life took other plans, but I was really looking forward to get to one. Uh, and, you know, now I joined Bitcoin Magazine, so I'm the Twitch project manager, and I will be at the uh, the Bitcoin conference in April coming up. So really looking forward to that oh, one. Oh, yeah. Did you, tell me, did you tell me that at TabConf that you were I, working with Bitcoin Magazine? Uh, so I had applied for the role, and I had not yet gotten the role yet. Ah, so I was okay. in contention, okay. waiting, didn't know. And yeah. then uh, a week later, they offered me the job, and I got it. So I joined uh, end of November. It's been a wild ride the last three weeks, but it's been awesome finally moving from the fiat world into the Bitcoin world. Hell, yeah. Congrats, dude. That's awesome. Thank you. Excited to work in forward, uh, working with other Bitcoiners like yourself and uh, all the good people in the space. So uh, I guess yeah. question I normally ask people on my podcast, specifically Bitcoiners, I guess, how did you come in touch with Bitcoin? What were your touch points? And then ultimately, what led you down the rabbit hole? So um, uh, we kind of got lucky on that because uh, we had a Bitcoin was kind of the culmination, my, my brother and I, uh, I mean, by we. Um, Bitcoin was kind of the culmination of uh, all of the things we were interested in at the time. My brother was studying economics at school. I'm sorry if they're a little loud. <laughs> no worries. Um, there's a delivery man here to murder everyone in the family and the dogs <laughs> and trying to make sure that uh, <laughs> uh, they protect everyone. But uh, he was studying economics at the time uh, at state. And... Um, uh, I was, uh, I had left film school and was doing my own thing in film, uh, doing like wedding videos, local commercials, like sort of stuff. I just kind of had my own media business and I wasn't quite sure about the direction. I was just kind of like moseying along. I was just doing enough stuff to get by, you know, and it was fun. Um, I was lazy. I just got out of college trying to figure out what the hell I wanted to do. And I was slowly discovering that there's a lot more money in tech um, than there was in film. And uh, I tech always came naturally to me. You know, I've been building custom computers, like just, you know, putting shit together and stuff since I was like 10 years old, like, right. Um, and uh, so I was getting really into tech. And at the exact same time, because my brother was having arguments with his economics professor, professors, because they would teach him X in macroeconomics and then Y in microeconomics, um, or even just in the same class, they teach him something one week and then two or three weeks later, they teach him something else. And literally they could not be true at the same time. Like they, they directly contradicted each other from a foundational, like if you took it back to the actual resources, like the idea that you could manipulate money and change 
what's happening. Like, like it just, it was not fitting with him. And he, so he would argue like there was just blocks. There were roadblocks in making a rational understanding so that you could just derive it. So if somebody asked you a question, you could figure it out. If both of these things were true, then there was no way to actually come to a conclusion. You know, like, um, it simply didn't, the puzzle pieces didn't fit together. So he was like arguing with them. He literally like, like sat down and argued with one of his professors after class for like two hours to the point that the guy was like, just, just you, you're supposed to memorize it. Please just leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> like he didn't, the professor didn't give a shit that there was like a huge contradiction and that he could not, he had no way to answer the question, which is why it lasted for two hours. Right? So anyway, my brother would come home and argue with me about it. He'd be like, how could this make sense? And uh, so we would go down, we're going down this like economics rabbit hole um, and uh, finding Mises after a pretty mm -hmm. long road, finding Hayek. Um, we actually went down the modern monetary theory path first because that actually that's actually more logically consistent than Keynesianism. It's just fundamentally wrong so there's like one piece that's fundamentally misunderstood with modern monetary theory that like money is somehow they basically say money is just a scoreboard, but then they completely miss the point that inflation is a actually a form of theft. It's actually redistributing from people who actually produce things to the people who are in debt and consume them. Um, but anyway, so we went down MMT, but then found our way towards Austrian economics as we continued to hit contradiction after contradiction. Um, so that's like, like, that was like really exciting for us. And we were also finding libertarianism at the same time because it aligned so perfectly with all of this economics. I was getting into tech, big into torrents and file sharing, just the idea yeah. of it. Like I, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, and I was starting to learn that tech was actually changing things. Like for my whole life, it had been a toy. It had been a way to play a game more fun than this. It had been StarCraft with my friends over, you know, um, uh, over the weekends. And then suddenly I was beginning to realize at that point and from the economics perspective and from the libertarian perspective, that tech wasn't just, it wasn't just a game. It wasn't just this fun stuff. Like it was literally changing the world. Like it was, it was a real impact and BitTorrent, BitTorrent shook industries. Um, and, and I was just like, man, this is so cool. So like, this is all the things that we're interested in at this time. And then my brother is arguing with somebody about the federal reserve on Facebook. And, uh, uh, this guy was like, you know, you would probably be interested in this thing called Bitcoin. It's like 2011. Like there's not, there's not shit about it. You know, it's, I think like maybe the Silk Road. No, that the Silk Road article is 2012. God, I don't know. There, there was very, very few resources, but there was this like this extreme nerd um, who happened to mention it to us. And so we go and we like look into it and it's the culmination of everything that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. Like, like it is the trifecta of it is BitTorrent. It is like the Internet and tech changing the world. It is libertarianism. It is economics, um, actual Austrian economics codified. And we were just like, holy shit, this is the coolest thing that has ever existed. And we were just 100% down the rabbit hole like that. It was the exact same night. We were we stayed up all night. I read the white paper. Um, I read the white paper to my brother while we were sitting there at the computer. A little, a little foreshadowing to the fact that I was going to have a podcast where I read shit to people. <laughs> and uh, little did he know. Um, and... Uh, I remember like that night we were, I mean, we got, we were like busted and like we were drinking and everything just like so, so intense on this. You know, we would go like down these rabbit holes of like thought and stuff where we would go economics for like four or five hours. And, uh, uh, when we, when we found Bitcoin, I remember, and I've told the story like a number of times, but, um, that we had just gone down and we were reading everything that we could get our hands on, which there, the supply of content was nothing essentially at the time. Um, but I had like a whole bunch of like editing and stuff that I needed to do. Uh, I think my brother had class the next day, but then like randomly, like we were just talking and still doing, going through all of this stuff. And we realized that the sun had come up. It was like nine o'clock in the morning and we had just gone the entire night. Just, I mean, 
full on full Bitcoin for like 12 solid hours. Um, and, uh, and we were like, shit, we have things to do. Like there's, a, <laughs> this is, this is a dangerous habit. Um, so that was, that was, yeah, that was my, uh, trip into Bitcoin. That was my, uh, found the rabbit hole and just dove head first and rolled the first couple of floors down, <laughs> down into it. To, yeah, it, was, that, it was, it was crazy. It was like, that's oh, awesome. What year was that by any chance if you don't like, or where about? It was it was 2011. It 2011. Was early, okay. Early 2011. Um, I remember because uh, when we first bought in, um, it was at the height of one of the early bubbles mm -hmm. um, because there was this like hundredth of a penny to like ten cent bubble, um, and then there was a <laughs> bubble, um, and then there was a uh, another one. It crashed back down to like under a penny, I think, after that, and then shortly thereafter, it shot up to a dollar. Um, and that's when word was kind of spreading. Um, and there was barely even an exchange at this point. Like, like Mt. Gox was essentially it. Um, and Mt. Gox was still kind of fresh at that time. Um, and I, I didn't know about it at this point. Um, but then uh, it was like crashing back down into the mids. And then when it broke back up above a dollar, it was just kind of on this tear. Like it was, you know, how it will just do this slow, steady growth with just nothing but green for like weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and, uh, and then it was getting into the multiple dollars and that was when we first heard about it when it was like $4 or $5 or something like that. Um, when we first looked at it, um, and then we we're like, oh man, we should just buy some just to, we should try to get some. And, uh, it was just so hard to get into, yeah. um, like to, like there were like the services were they were the equivalent of going on the internet into the back alley behind the dumpster and talking to the dude who knows the other dude that can get you the get you the connection i mean it was just like what is this weird corner of the internet that i have found myself in yeah and uh uh but after a week maybe and uh at least twice being totally convinced that all of our money was gone <laughs> they just like no it just we just got scammed <laughs> um, uh the money actually made it to mount gox we had to go like through two bullshit services to get there um and uh bitcoin was already like 30 dollars um so like in that span of time it had gone from like five and we're like freaking out it's like we gotta get in like every day we're watching it's like it's ten dollars it's fifteen dollars <laughs> we're missing it hyper bitcoinization is happening um and uh it went to like 30 and we proceeded to buy all the little tiny amount of savings that we had we dumped it all in at the fucking top absolute top and it crashed it just the most horrific bear market um for like three months it was just nothing after three months of just nothing but green three months of nothing but red um and uh fell all the way back down to like a buck something at some did, point did and, you guys uh, keep it or did you guys sell it and try and recoup your losses or so uh what we my my perspective on it was that okay um there was I, I couldn't really if somebody asked me a complicated question about bitcoin i couldn't answer it um i had we had decided to go all all in we're broke as hell we live in a we were living in a trailer together um and uh we decided to go all in quote unquote on what was essentially a cool sounding idea that we really couldn't have told you a thing about um we very ignorantly went into this investment and uh so and the the money that we put in had lost so much that it was practically nothing um uh like it was like we put in like a i think like a thousand dollars or something and i did the math one day and it was like 72 yeah in like three months um and i was just like I don't, I have made the either the dumbest mistake ever, or this is just a crazy new thing and volatile and like, 
you know, am I early or have I just done the dumbest fucking thing and just bought into this complete pipe dream? And um, I decided that all the money was gone in in the real sense. I mean, it wouldn't have paid our electricity bill. Yeah, uh, which our water got cut off that month because <laughs> because we had no money. Um, and uh, we only went without water for like a day. Um, uh, thanks, mom. And uh, so uh, I decided that I wasn't going to get out unless I could explain properly why it was a dumb decision. Like we got in ignorantly. I wasn't going to get out ignorantly. Um, I wasn't going to make the same decision, the same p potential mistake two times by just yeah. <laughs> blindly trading on complete lack of information. Yeah. Um, so I just, after I, I remember because uh, after I did the math that day, I threw up. Um, $1,000 was a lot of money to watch just vanish. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, it was literally everything that we had um, and uh, above our water bill. Um, <laughs> and so I threw up. And I was like, and I sat back down. And I was like, I'm such an idiot. I'm so stupid. Uh, and I was like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how the hell this thing works. Is it actually going to stick around? And so I just started to read. I just started to read. I, I decided that every single thing I could get my hands on, I was going to dig further in. I was going to read all the critiques. Were they intelligent? Did they know more about the guy who was telling me that, there is promise here, you know, like who knew the most um, and who could articulate it the best. And I just got, I just consumed all of it. And the more and more I consumed, the more I was like, the pipe dream was actually, was actually the correct perspective. Um, there's actually something really solid here. And my conviction just grew with time. And, you know, it's just what I do is I just read. <laughs> yeah that's awesome i mean i so i guess i'm, I'm sitting here waited with bated breath uh, i'm just curious did you leave it was it through mount gox that i'm assuming you got the bitcoin is, is that right and then did you leave mm -hmm. it there no so uh, you you did well, you, there there were some there, there was there was some mount gox loss um, okay but not much um my big loss throughout this whole span was some burnt keys by accident Oh, um, but uh, I mean, I'm 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 doing fine. Uh, like, you know, I've rebought and sold at times. Not not sold like, oh, I got to get out of Bitcoin or oh, it's crashing. But sold like, we got married and I got a house. You know, like like mm -hmm. I needed to. I, I, I can't. You can't wait thirty years to get on with your life and actually start a family and do those things. Um, like that's the whole point of money is time preference is that what is worth it today to start adding value and accomplishing something in your life uh that's not worth waiting 10 years for you know yeah um so uh, uh but outside of that um my conviction has only grown and i've just tried to continue to stack through all of it as much as i could that's awesome. That's awesome. So I guess then that leads me to my next question. So when did you start doing Bitcoin Audible and ultimately, you know, start reading Bitcoin articles and then giving your take and guys take? Uh, yeah. when, when did that start? And how did you go down the rabbit hole of that doing your own research and doing all that reading yourself? I'll tell you, I should have started it in 2015, but I actually started it in 2018. Okay. Um, I had <laughs> been thinking about doing something along those lines. In fact, my brother and I, there's probably like, there's two different podcast ideas and probably about 10 or 11 lost episodes of us trying to record stuff and make a podcast that never got published. Um, like it was kind of on the back burner and I'd been thinking about it for a long time. And uh, mostly I feel like I was leaning on my brother and probably he was leaning on me. And so everybody was waiting. We were both waiting for the other person to like have the conviction to just like schedule it and make it important and yeah. like a thing. Um, but when you're, you're broke and nobody has really time to do anything and just like, you know, it's just hard. Um, and uh, uh, so it kept get, just getting it pushed off. And then in 2017, there was a huge 
crazy bull market and the fork and everything. And after it was kind of the bomb went off and the dust started to settle and we were clearly moving back into a bear market, I was looking back on it and it was so crazy because it all happened in like three months. Yeah. Four months. Like it was absolute insanity for just this tiny period of time. And I was like, I have been wanting to do a podcast for so long at that point. And I just let one of the biggest opportunities in my lifetime go by without participating. You know, like I yeah. was not, I was not in Bitcoin, just on Reddit, just on Twitter. You know, I'm just following people and liking stuff. I'm inconsequential. Like I, like I'm just a passive you know speculator over like like speculator in the sense that i'm just watching yeah um, and i was like i cannot believe that i have done this again that i have gone through an entirely another like bubble and crash uh and i really have nothing to show for it other than the fact that i've stacked some like i'm always, always stacking you know um and i was like if i ever want to get out of being an internet technician if i ever want to like really invest and do something real in the bitcoin space i gotta do it now like yeah like i can't i need to lay the groundwork before this happens again um and so that's when i was like kind of at the heart of when the bear market was getting a move on um and it's also the perfect time too because it's quiet you know like there's not like a whole bunch of nonsense i don't have to worry about the um uh, uh, don't have to worry about getting a ton of followers and uh, viewers or whatever, and then it all plummeting <laughs> because it moves with the price, you know. Um, so I just laid out the groundwork and started started doing the show. Um, it was actually one day I was um, so I was an internet technician at the time. Um, mm -hmm. and I was trying to do my Linux certification um, and uh, to become like kind of like a systems admin or something. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but at the time I was in a work van running around p fixing people's internet and doing poll work and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, I came home one day from work. I'd been listening to a bunch of, uh, I mean, audiobooks and podcasts, like you wouldn't believe uh, back then you could still buy audible credits on eBay in batches of like 50. Yeah. I, good God. You would not believe the number I've gone. I went through like I'm on the road eight hours a day. I just did nothing but listen to stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of my pet peeves, one of my things was that, and I list, I, I, I even bought like a couple of those, like bot, re the good bot readers that would like yeah. read an article out loud to you. Yeah. And they were just dog shit. They were so bad. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't focus on it. Like if it wasn't articulated well and like with good emphasis, it, it might as well just not be on because I wasn't pulling any information from it. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Um, I know what you mean. And uh, so I just kind of gave up on that. And for years throughout all of this, while we were still trying to come up with a good idea for a podcast and, you know, whether it's going to be Liberty focused with a Bitcoin edge or Bitcoin focused, blah, blah, blah. I was just constantly like, I wish somebody would just read these fucking articles to me. Like, I, I wish I could just get this in audio. Um, and then one day I came home, I was kind of annoyed with it. And there was a really good uh, article I had wanted to read. Um, and then, uh, Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin magazine actually was my first, <laughs> was the first read on the show. Um, uh, just some like official institution, the, the Weiss, uh, ratings, uh, actually started rating Bitcoin and, and crypto, um, which, you know, there's a whole period where like extremely mundane news when you look at it, like kind of in hindsight. Yeah. It was like big news. Is it like there's like a institution here that is recognizing that this is real? Holy God, you know. Um, I remember when the first time it was Bitcoin was there was an episode about Bitcoin on The Good Wife. Yeah. Oh my God, the internet went nuts. Like the whole Bitcoin space was like, Holy God, we're legitimate. <laughs> um, and uh, so I just sat down on my bed when I got home, right after I got off work, and sat with uh, my iPhone in my hand and read it into a notes like the little yeah voice voice memo app or whatever um and then went up and just published it and that was the first episode and then i just kept doing it
that's awesome. That's really, really cool. So it, it's funny, like uh, how you came on to it from like the libertarian background and you and your brother arguing with like macroeconomic trends or microeconomic trends to your professors. So mine is kind of different. I mean, I guess everyone's Bitcoin journey is different. Uh, I'm an engineer by, by trade. So it's funny that I okay. went from, I'm a chemical engineer by degree and I worked in engineering for six <laughs> years. Yep. And then now I'm in uh, digital marketing and talking about Bitcoin. So two very different trends. <laughs> two of my good friends are marketing majors. They're like, what do you mean like an engineer? And you left your engineering degree and job to go into the Bitcoin space. Now you do what we do. I was like, yeah, I guess. Yes, that just goes to show the piece of paper is not as valuable as, as it is. But in yeah. engineering, it's very funny. Like we had an exam in, uh, it was actually green engineering, ironically, or green engineering technologies was the name of the course. And uh, the professor was very cool. Uh, yeah, so he, he was basically talking about green technologies. And uh, in the class, he was, it, was, it wasn't a tough class. It, it was, uh, but like his exams were like, he was asking just very simple questions and all the engineers would write out these long worded definitions or descriptions or, or whatever it may be. And, you know, one of them was like, what is engineering? He just asked, what is engineering? And people are like, they took the textbook definition. It was an open book, open notes exam. And, and people that aren't in engineering school, uh, professors used to joke that you could have, you know, open book, open internet. You could have another professor and these exams are still going to be really freaking hard. So he gave us the whole, uh, the textbook and it was like people were writing the exact word for word definition. And that's not what he wanted. He wanted like your own definition of it. He didn't want you regurgitating. He wanted you to use your mind and think. So we all, I think everyone in the class didn't get the question right. He's like, what engineering is to me is using math or science to solve complex problems and make companies money. And that's basically like the definition of it. And it's like, okay, yeah, we math and science, I'm pretty good at. But then he had the component of money in there, which I thought was very interesting. And so, you know, after graduating, I, I was like, okay, well, what, what's money for me? And, you know, you learn about the traditional finance route of, you know, stocks and bonds and mutual funds and how to invest. And I thought I was doing the right thing, the right thing, or like at least what mainstream media teaches you of like maxing out your 401k, putting a bunch of money into a Roth IRA, like going down the whole thing. And I know learning from my dad, my dad is a computer science guy, a very geeky techie guy. And he had done the right thing and he has a ton of money in his 401k and IRA and he's done all the right things. He has a decent, you know, he just retired a few weeks ago and he's doing quite well. I mean, in terms of uh, at least in a fiat basis, I guess. And, uh, you know, he took the advice of like, you know, investing in broad market funds and they grow up, you know, seven to 9% based on market trends of kind of the past 50 years, hundred years, whatever what you want to use. Anyway, so I was kind of going down that rat, rabbit hole. But then the thing that I really hated about the 401ks is that they limit you. Like normally it's, you know, you're using Fidelity or BlackRock or whatever company, Charles Schwab, and you could only pick either their mutual funds or broad index funds. And I'm like, okay. And then doing enough yeah, there's study. There's like three options on my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And they really stink. This? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, so then I was doing a lot of reading of Buffett and Munger. They were kind of my heroes and, and even a lot of Ray Dalio and stuff like that. And the reason they were so good is like, you know, they talk about diversification if you don't know what you're doing, but like uh picking like specific ones if you do like warren buffett's famous quote is like if you've got 25 amazing ideas write them all down and then take the top five and screw the last 20 and like focus yeah. on those five and that was kind of his thing of like if you have 25 or 30 investments are they all good investments probably not like your yep. top five conviction whether it's apple amazon google facebook whatever it may be the the top companies of the s p 500 those are the ones you should focus on and i i was like okay well i can do this better so while still doing the broad index funds because i'm like that's kind of my safe bet i'm going to start doing more stock picking and and i wasn't going to do stock trading it was specifically like i like company x because I see that they're going to grow in the next 10, 20, 30 years, like long-term, long-time horizons. So I was doing that with Robinhood. And, you know, my first three years out of college, I was kind of doing broad index funds, maxing out 401k. I was like, well, I want to level it up. So then I started downloading Robinhood and was kind of doing stock picking and finance in, in that vein. And uh, it was doing well. I like, I was doing very well. I like 10 X, a couple of my investments of like things. I'm like, oh, we're really early here. Like Penn National Gaming, for example, oh, uh, they, they, they kind of had, uh, they bought into bar, uh, Barstool and I was like, you know, love it or hate it, whether you like Barstool or not, like they're going to be a big company, like this mm -hmm. is a good time to do it. So then lo and behold, the crash of 2020 occurs and I'm like, you know, everyone was freaking out and I had, I'd done something stupid, but it, it worked out to my benefit. So I had basically set stop losses. I had watched a lot of my stocks ride up double, 2X, 3X, whatever it is. I said sure, stop yeah. losses to sell them if it dropped 4% at all. 
So in January of 2020, I watched as my entire Robinhood portfolio, about, you know, 10 grand, 20, 15 grand, somewhere in that range, get liquidated, like yeah. liquidated. So I had already ridden up. Like, so if it, I bought it at 10 bucks, it went up to 20 bucks and then it got liquidated at like 18 or 19 or tw- whatever the math is. Uh, I, not good on, on the fly with doing math, but yeah. so it got liquidated. So I'm like sitting there all in cash. I'm like, something's going on in the world. And wait, I didn't wait, know liquidate, about the- You mean- it liquidated just like you hit your stop loss. So my stop loss liquidated to cash. So I'm sitting yeah, with yeah, a pile okay, of cash. Okay. Like I wasn't like shorts or anything. Usually yeah, I'm I, thinking of usually I'm thinking of liquidated or whatever. Like like I got wiped out. Like no no no. An so option and it no, went to zero. No, no 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 not liquid. No no options. It was I had the stock. If it hits this price, sell. So I had now, ha- ha- yeah, loss. I had hit all these Good games. Good man on the stop loss. Yeah, yeah, guess, yeah. you know, like. <laughs> exactly. So I watched it, but not just like one stock. I had like, I, like I said, I probably had close to 30 things. So not really yep. taking Warren Buffett's advice, but things that I'd liked, you know, some hedge of Amazon, Facebook, Google, whatever. They got liquidated to cash. And it, was, it wasn't just one thing. It wasn't, it was, it was the health sector. It was finance. It was commodities. It was like anything and everything. It turned red and I'm like, okay, something's wrong here. And it was kind of like in January, February, it's like, oh no, we're good. We're going to keep going. And then obviously, you know, the, the, the pandemic hit. And then obviously I watched as the whole market crashed. And then that was when in my mind, Warren Buffett's like, if you know, your favorite store had a 30% off, 50%, 70% off sale. Like, why would you fear that? You love that. So then I, I waited kind of mid April, I started putting more money in. And by June 1st, I had put all my money back in. And while at the same time, I had been listening to We Study Billionaires with Preston Pish, Stig mm-hmm. Broderson, and that whole podcast. I've been following it for years. And I always loved their quarterly masterminds. So now we're kind of mm-hmm. lining up timeframes to get properly here. Um, so in end of March, they were talking about you know the pandemic, and they saw this as a good buying opportunity as everything was hitting record lows. So while I had been putting into stocks, you know, I did Penn National Gaming at like nine bucks, and then it mm-hmm. subsequently shot up to $108, and I was able to sell there. Ooh. Uh, yeah, so like 10x and it was, it was awesome returns. But anyway, so he mentioned, so each of them mentioned a pick that they like. So Preston picked Bitcoin and I was kind of like, ah, this cryptocurrency thing, it's, it's not my thing. Like I kind of knew what I like or what I want. And I was like, uh, no, I'm fine with Bitcoin. Stig, I think ended up picking Google, which he had picked before in years past. And then there's Hari, one of their guests, and uh, to- Tobias. So yeah, yeah. Hari picked another stock who I had not really heard of, but in broader index, it was a global company. And then Hari was saying a short on Netflix. And I, I was not in the shorting game. I was not in the crypto game. So I kind of looked into Stig's pick and Hari's pick. They weren't really my fit. So whatever. Lo and behold, a couple more months goes by and I had been doing my thing and it was fine. And then June rolls around and they do the quarterly mastermind then. Preston says Bitcoin again. And I had never in the, in the history of, you know, listen to the podcast, had they ever said in back-to-back episodes or quarters recommended the same thing. So my mm-hmm. mind was blown. I was like, what did I miss? Cause I really respect mm-hmm. Preston and I blew him off the first time. So I messed up and something's wrong. And by June 6th or 7th, I had bought into Bitcoin on Robinhood. So mistake in and of itself, but ultimately I started taking some of the profits of things that had done your really- first step is your first step. Exactly. Yeah. So ultimately it's always going to be a mistake in Bitcoin, your first step. Right? So ultimately, and I bought in, it was maybe nine K 10 K 11 K something like that mm-hmm. into Robinhood. And then that's kind of when I started going down the Man, rabbit so hole. You're, you're fresh. You're fresh. I, I am new. So boat, baby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, tw- class, of tw- <laughs> class of 2020. Yeah. And now I work for Bitcoin magazine. So I'm, I'm getting yeah. to the story. So basically, you know, I started doing more digging into Bitcoin, but I still thought there was other, you know, it was a, a better thing in, in a broad index of portfolios, 10%, 5%, something like that. So I put money into it and it was, you know, I'm like, okay, cool. Then like by November, I had like finally gone down the rabbit hole. I read like uh, a bunch of different Bitcoin books. I hadn't run the Bitcoin standard, but I'd listened to Sailor Talk. I've been listening to Breathe Love. I've been listening to you. I've been listening to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. So I've been like, or uh, I, I actually I don't even know how that started yet, but I've been listening to various podcasts and stuff. And I was like, okay, like it's the time to strike. So that's mm-hmm. when I liquidated my whole Robinhood portfolio. And I was like, I hate Robinhood. And then ultimately the GameStop thing came up in January of this year. So I was like, I made the right choice by leaving them, but you know, kind of finding Swan Bitcoin or Cash App or different platforms to buy. I did buy on Coinbase, which, you know, made, made another mistake, one mistake to another, but Ultimately now, you know, here you I withdraw am. withdraw from them at least. It's not, yeah. E- exactly. So I, I had withdrawn it to a hardware wallet and I had gone like got a, a rapid progression of like, I need to learn more about this faster and faster, get into hardware wallets, do different things. And uh, ultimately that's where I got to right now. And, uh, you know, I kind of see it as a solution. I'm sure you have as well with going down the rabbit hole. So I guess 
that that's kind of my story for you and my listeners. I know they've heard it, but I guess now this leads me to my next thought of, you know, as I've orange pilled many of my good friends over this last year and so, um, and the pandemics, you know, beside to reside and like restrictions are opening up now. Why do you still think that in these last two years or as we're coming up on two years, why do you think that Bitcoiners have been so right of the root cause of the issue? Obviously, we've seen a lot of issues globally with riots for various reasons, for you know civil rights reasons or racial issues or all these different things. And it seems that everyone always says, oh, this is the problem. Oh, we need more money here. We need more money there. It's more central planning here. Like everyone thinks like the government, whether it's state, local, federal or whatever, is going to come and rescue you. But why did why have been why have Bitcoiners been so right to say that the root cause of the issue is down to bad money? And like, that's the root cause of the problem. Because that is the root cause of the problem. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> because they're right. Um, I think it's just because money has been such a point of ignorance for everyone. Um, and that that essentially imbalances and horrible literally horrible manipulation has been uncontested for a very very long time like it's literally as if we've just been putting arsenic in all of our food in like small amounts and we've got all of these debilitating diseases and you know like chronic disorders is like a hundred different which it's kind of funny we've been doing something not a lot unlike that actually in our food um but uh but just as an analogy um We've been slowly poisoning ourselves. And then when you stop taking it and your body can actually heal a little bit, even if it's just like a few people, you know, it becomes shocking. And then you're like, no guys, like, yeah, they're putting, they're literally all the food that you're eating now. They've just announced that they're putting twice as much arsenic in it. All of your issues are going to get worse. And then they're like, all of our issues got worse. And like, like it's a surprising. Um, and I think it's just because there's just so much Bitcoin forces you to ask what the hell money is. And nobody's ever asked. Nobody asks. Nobody thinks about it. It's just there. It's 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 water is wet. You know, it's like a, it's like a fish in water. You know, um, what's the what's that analogy or, or kind of a uh, what do you call it? a wives tale joke? I don't know. The uh, two two young fish pass pass an old fish and uh, and he's like uh how's the water today or something like that and and after they go they go by or whatever the young ones are like what the hell's water <laughs> yeah um like you just aren't aware of it because it's so pervasive it's so always there in front of you that it's just like it's just there you know um and um uh, bitcoin forces you to wonder is there such thing as a better money what the hell is a better money look like what is a why is the money good or bad? You know, like what, what the hell does it even do? <laughs> like, like I just, I just get points on a piece of paper. You know, like obviously the points are worth stuff. I go, I buy stuff with these points. You know, yeah. like, um, so uh, you just start thinking about the point system as opposed to just what what you relating what you have to what you can go pick up at the store. Um, and so once you start thinking about that question. Once you start realizing why the point system matters, what money does, why prices exist, suddenly you just have this whole different lens that just brings incredible clarity to what the hell is going on in the world. Um, it's almost shocking how clear it is afterward. It's like, how could I have been blind to this? Yeah. Um, and then you, you know, you put on those glasses and you know your 2800 vision becomes 2020 and then you just look and they're, they're like oh we're printing a trillion dollars it's like well that's gonna fuck everything up like <laughs> like we're gonna have higher prices we're gonna have supply chain issues um this is only gonna make the government far more arrogant and involved in our lives and blah 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 the whole list of things and then six months later a year later that's exactly what happens and everybody's like how did you know yeah it's like you put on some glasses um and uh that's you know like it, you start like asking the, the right questions and suddenly the answers become a lot more obvious 
it's like the Eric Andre meme. I know uh, Bitcoin culture has been pretty synonymous with memes, but where he's yeah. like takes the gun and he's shooting the one guy on the yeah. couch. He's like, how could you do this? Like, you how know, blame- the government do this. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it's the government blaming some external thing related yeah. to un- whatever they did, like inflation. It's like, oh, my gosh, the the uh, the damn corporations are charging people too much. It's like I can't believe no. Big Turkey did this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that that's the, the funny thing about it. It's 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 so the thing that's sad is and i still i don't know because i've heard different things from different bitcoiners and i'd love your take do you think they know like and by the, they know i mean i'm talking like whatever you know the politicians at large you know and the people that work for them do you think they know and it's just like we need to just keep telling the lie or do you think they really they they all ate their own you know cooking and they think that like no we we the more we do the more we constrict the more we can help like i, I still i go back and forth some people are like they have to know because they're grand masterminds or it's like or are they actually that dense that they don't understand or they're that dumb that they don't understand the manipulation i'll tell you I think the majority, the overwhelming majority have no idea. They are completely honest in their open support of what will destroy society. Um, But there is a small number that 100% know what the fuck they are doing. Yeah. And they're doing it on purpose. I kind of fall in that camp. It's like, you know, it comes down from the top down and, you know, you hate to get into conspiracy theories about who that person is or who those people are. But yeah, I definitely agree. There's some people that realize, like, I know Jeff Booth brought it up in one of his podcasts. He had sent the price of tomorrow to a bunch of high up execs and he didn't mention names because he didn't want to do that, but he sent it out and they're like, Jeff's absolutely right, but we're not stopping money printing. And they're like, but you know, the problem is we're not stopping money printing. Like that was just, that was the the song. Like they completely 100% agreed, but we're not stopping the money printing. So it's like, it's like, okay, you know, from the, the higher up execs and stuff that they know what's going on. They know the game, they know how it's worked and how it's rigged, but uh, that doesn't mean that they're going to change the way that it's currently going on. So uh, yeah. You know, believe whatever you want about conspiracy theories, Rothschild system control blah 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 um but they know what they're doing the the giant like the the banking families um like i think it was like the rothschild kids like group or whatever yeah um are worth like 1.4 1.5 trillion dollars just in what they like own in the bank um and like there is absolutely a family like a like a a group of people who are some of the absolute wealthiest and most powerful people on the planet who have been there with their families for centuries and centuries like yeah. it's the same people and they 100 percent know what they are doing and and i don't mean that in some like you know call it some satanic conspiracy whatever bullshit you want to attach to it but they it's not a conspiracy they talk about it yeah they openly talk about it there are recorded conversations there are they on video they meet with people and they talk about what they are doing none of it is a conspiracy to them they they're they don't hide it the official statements don't say it that way the system itself the politicians don't say it the way they say it but they openly they talk about what they are doing they talk about destroying the money of a society so that they like of countries like um uh uh oh god what's his name klaus Klaus schwab no not not schwab i was thinking about uh the nazi guy what's his name Hitler? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, the um, the guy who profits off uh, pushing uh, uh, government policy to essentially destroy the currency into horrible policy and then uh, makes enormous profits off basically betting that the country is going to collapse. Um, oh, uh, d- uh, not Davos. Over and uh, over again. Oh, my gosh. Not I, what is his name? Why can I not? Nancy Pelosi and him were in a picture together, and the yeah. running joke is that she made more money than him. Oh my god, it's not that da- I keep saying Davos, but it's and he's like mean king about like corrupt, like rich dude. Um, what is his name? Why? Why have I brain farted on this so bad? 
anyway um if you look it up uh, I'll, I'll look it up i'll get it to you um but basically the idea is that, like like he's not confused about what's happening you know like he knows exactly what the consequences of monetary policy are because he has been playing monetary policy to cause destruction so that he can run put options he knows what's going on you know like he knows what the end game of all of this stuff is he's probably getting his puts ready um and like so like you don't have a trillion dollars in an environment like this unless you know what happens when trillion dollar decisions are made you know the outcome if you don't know the outcome if you don't know what this means when you're printing six trillion dollars and pumping up the stock market and watching debt levels skyrocket then you're never you just don't stay a trillionaire you don't stay in that position you screw it up you stay there for centuries and centuries and centuries because it's the same playbook and you know exactly how to play it and you know exactly what it does and that's yeah. not a conspiracy it's just basic logic yeah it's you're george never soros, gonna stay the there way. if you don't know what it means do what george soros by the way is soros what it... thank you Good i God. couldn't i couldn't think of it for the life yeah. of me but like he has explicitly gone to countries to orchestrate this so that he can make money yeah like that he, he multiple like many many times he has done this that guy's not confused about what happens yeah you know that guy bets all of his money on it and keeps getting richer as he yeah. succeeds as he's on the demise of other people basically yeah yeah um but anyway yeah so that that's that's what i think um i think the vast majority are boobs they're just they're just morons who have been drug into it who went through the public schooling system and would never ask what money was and don't understand anything they're just like how do i promise as much as possible to get an office and then how do i deliver it and i can't believe these guys are saying i can't spend this much your debt no debt ceilings don't matter i think that's i think most of them are just idiots but there is a very very serious subset of people um in the political class um that know exactly what's happening yeah and i think that's a great point i and, and people don't even realize this too the amount of currency that's in 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 circulation currencies or the fiat currency is actually debt based so meaning that mm -hmm. if the united states if, if every corporation the united states government and state were to pay off their debt there would be literally zero dollars in circulation. People don't realize yeah. that. And it's like, what do you mean there'd be zero dollars? It mean like, oh, well, your corporation paid off all the debts, so the currency is not needed for that. Oh, the government paid off its debt, so it's not needed for anything. Bitcoin's the first one where you have to put in work or, you know, take electricity from whatever source, you know, mine for it. And then you're gifted Bitcoin for doing so. It's a credit based yeah. instead of a debt based. You know, you did work and you're rewarded for it. Um, obviously, you know, there's inklings to people talking about gold with, you know, doing work and getting this shiny rock. And, you know, I think gold worked, but until it until it didn't, when it centralized into the banks and it's like, you know, they'll paper trade you all types of gold and stuff like that all you want. But yeah. the reason it doesn't work is because you need to take self custody of it and use it as a as a money. And most places won't even take gold. So then it's like you run into the same issue. Okay, all right, I'm gonna leave with the bank. I'm gonna they're gonna charge for me to store it. And you know, give uh, me some paper so I can spin it at the store. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Where Bitcoin, uh, I I've been going on to this recently that I'm worried about. Like obviously, as more and more banks or institutions come into it and they don't self custody that you know mm -hmm. they leave it with a custodian whether it's coinbase or grayscale or whatever we mm -hmm. can run into the same issue but then i'm like chris it, think about it like this like if you have a debt and i wanted to if you gave me bitcoin or you gave me um there's a debt between us and i want it settled instantaneously we open up mm -hmm. a lightning channel i could close that channel at any point and it liquidates and you know when we see all these 2008 financial crises 2012 we're now seeing with evergrand potentially you know defaulting on debt payments like that could happen in bitcoin but it happens instantaneously, you know, oh, I need money from you. And then it comes to me and then I need to pay my debtor. And then it, it can, it can unwind and we can get back to an equilibrium again. And that's, mm -hmm. I guess, part of the volatility of Bitcoin. It goes up and down because people are trying to long it or short it or do something in the middle is if you self custody and you don't owe it to anyone, you know, you're that's in the best position to be in basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I kind of have, have had those thoughts before, as well just like oh if we end up in a heavy paper environment and a heavily leveraged environment and we just get institutions um trading prompt bitcoin promises yeah. um it could have the same fate as gold um but uh i kept coming back to the fact that it's just too damn easy to withdraw 
like the reason gold, there is absolutely nothing about if, if payment apps and institutions or whatever are accepting lightning or Bitcoin as like, like as a, as a merchant, like even if you're just using it as a custodial app, like Chivo or some, something like that, or strike, you're still speaking the lightning standard, the Bitcoin standard, which means that you can just as easily have real custodial, like it has to be interoperable with my breeze wallet or my Phoenix wallet, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to speak the same language, which means that you're not having the problem of people only, only accepting paper Bitcoin. Yeah. Like it's just not, it's not even possible because as soon as you start speaking the protocol, as soon as you start speaking the app's language of Bitcoin or Lightning, it's not paper anymore because I can withdraw it directly to mine, mm -hmm. um, to my wallet. And I will never accept a Bitcoin, any substantial amount of money. I mean, like I have, I trust Fold with uh, 4 million sats right now or whatever that I've stacked. And I am trusting Swan Bitcoin up to 0 0.05. So what is that? 5 million Bitcoin yeah. or 5 million sats? <laughs> 5 million Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> uh, 5 million sats before my auto withdrawal hits. Um, so there's very small, right? Like a few thousand of your Of your net worth, yeah. Yes. Of uh, what I'm trusting them with as a Bitcoin promise, as a Bitcoin IOU. But the second it is substantial, is on my keys. I verify it. Yeah. So at least in my own little world, if I was holding gold right now of any consequential value or any relative value to what I hold in Bitcoin, 98% of it would almost necessarily be paper. Yeah. And 2% of it would be real gold. I'd have like a bar, you know? Um, and my Bitcoin situation is exactly the opposite. 98% is real Bitcoin. 2% is paper, is promises. Um, and that is an increasingly small amount. And with Lightning, it's there's even less of a reason for me, I mean, being kind of a techie, um, there's even less of a reason for me to hold promises because I can just as easily put it on Lightning and it's super active and everybody can accept it. So the ability to, the incredible ease and the fact that it is 100% international and that anybody who starts accepting Bitcoin or Lightning will necessarily shoot themselves in the foot if they aren't speaking the protocol because they're putting up a walled garden again around something that inherently doesn't have a walled garden. It would be like only accepting payment from Cash App with Bitcoin because you accept Cash App's paper Bitcoin, but then you don't actually just put an address so people can pay you from Strike, from Venmo, from Blue Wallet, from Green Wallet, from Phoenix. Like, like rather mm -hmm. than yeah. you're just... You're just saying, I only want 1% of the market to be able to talk to me. It's like, no bullshit. You're just going to speak Bitcoin. Um, and uh, uh, because of that, whereas those walled gardens exist inherently with gold, there is no way to not have them. Yeah. Whereas they inherently do not exist with Bitcoin. I do not see a feasible way to reinstitute the problem of too much paper Bitcoin that does not just get wiped out or leverage that does not just get cleared within a few months, a year tops, you know, like yeah. it's, it's just with the, it's what we see now. It's what we see now goes up for two months. Everybody gets overzealous over leveraged paper promises and the CME futures, blah, 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 crashes back down, wipes that shit out. We find a floor, we go rally again. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I guess I worry, and this this leads to my next question for the next five to ten years for Bitcoiners. Kind of tying back to your article talking about the infrastructure bill, um, that was definitely one of the ones that you're not that you're not passionate in all of them, but it was definitely a, a, a guy swan rant of talking <laughs> about the provisions that they kind of snuck in there, the the treasury mm -hmm. ultimately under Janet Yellen, and uh, we kind of know her opinions on Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. That. Basically, they're they're trying to to make it more difficult for people. And I know, uh, you know, states like Texas, Wyoming, Florida, you know, the, the gambit that we've all heard 
you know, they're, they're trying to welcome innovation and they're trying to welcome Bitcoiners and trying mm -hmm. to prop up their economies. I, I wouldn't say Texas needs it and, and Florida's in a pretty good state, but definitely it's interesting as a state like Wyoming, where uh, they're not a state that they're kind of a flyer state. And that's no, I, I would love to visit Wyoming, Senator Loomis, if you want me, I will definitely be there in a heartbeat. But uh, it's uh, not a state that I would ever think to really be like, oh, like I should go visit Wyoming or, yeah. you know, a certain state. It's the it's only just, reason it got on my list. Is, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but definitely if they welcome innovation and, you know, if they have a robust uh, banking laws that I know Caitlin Long's working on and stuff like that, it would definitely be a spot that I'd love to check out and, and explore and, you know, maybe one day live. You know, I won't cross it off the list, list for sure. So it was interesting. I know that you said a lot of the regulations, obviously they went in and they were trying to do the Loomis or the uh, uh, the Loomis or I forget what the, the Toomey um, amendments. Obviously the Cruz amendment was just to wipe it completely. I think a lot of Bitcoiners and cryptocurrency in general. I was on that one. I was well, just like, just take that shit out, man. But, that, I think we were all in favor of that. Yeah, I think the reality of the situation, we knew that that was not going to be the case when money was involved. Or I, mm -hmm. And I think you made a great point. They said that they were going to make 27 billion or 28 billion off cryptocurrencies. I'm like, where did, who did the math? I'd love to know the math on where you get 28 really? billion, just pulled it out of the air, 28 billion for cryptocurrencies. That's how we're going to pay for this. I'm like, uh, uh, like, is that day trading? Is that like just on taxation? Like, uh, nah, they just made that shit up. <laughs> so, and you made a good point. Up. You're and just like, they just literally pulled it out of the air and they just made it up. So, mm -hmm. While I don't believe like, you know, Bitcoin doesn't need an Elon, a War Elizabeth Warren, you know, a Warren Buffett, a you, a me or anything, obviously certain uh, governments and regimes can make it more difficult. And an and interesting like place like the United States that kind of fought against dictators and monarchs, you know, you would hope to be a place of like freedom and, you know, your choice and free market economy. Where, where do you think Bitcoin or specifically in the United States are going to be in the next five to 10 years and kind of incorporating the infrastructure bill? If they're making more difficult, there could be a very good reason that you and your wife and, you know, me and my girlfriend or my family decide to leave the country. And I hate to say flee like a refugee, but if like we're going to be penalized for whatever reason for holding Bitcoin. Yeah. Wh wh where do you see the United States in the next five to 10 years that you think? I go back and forth between everything looks like it's in constant decline but the u.s still looks like the best positioned in the world um and mostly because the mostly because of the culture um there is still a very very strong culture of entrepreneurship of go fuck yourself leave me alone um despite everything it's still the 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 precedents and the the history of the American Revolution of uh, the Alamo like like that has an effect that has an effect. It's not arbitrary that those things define who we how we think about ourselves. Um, and luckily, there are a lot of well, come and take it. Uh, there's a lot of that mentality in the country still. Um, and I don't see it in a lot of other places. Luckily, I feel like it's growing. Um, and I think it's more growing out of people realizing that lines have been crossed. And so I hope it spreads further and faster. But I don't see an easy exit anywhere. Um, Texas, Tennessee, Florida, Wyoming are on the list. But I don't see a clear winner outside of the United States. Um, and uh, very few are standing up in the sense of like literally like rather than just like trying to do the minimal compliance or stay away from it but literally saying no this is stupid we have got to stop doing this we can't move in this direction anymore as majority in the u.s yeah and um so um i think I think if there was a stand to be made, it's here. Um, so I intend to stay. Maybe it means I move to another state. Um, I'm certainly leaving on the table to leave, but a couple of my prime targets kind of went the way of psychosis um, in a very quick fashion. And I just think like, God, if I had rushed on that decision and gone with what seemed like the best option a year and a half ago, um and decided to up and move my family to switzerland or whatever i would not have been happy i'd have been like i have made a terrible decision we need to go back you know <laughs> um so um uh there's 
you know, there's there's a lot to be said of that. Um, uh, luckily, I, I do think I, I do think this is a relatively well positioned as incompetent as much of our government is um, as horrifically corrupt um, and as bad as the monetary situation is going to be. It's also highest per capita adoption of Bitcoin. It's also highest per capita. I support Second Amendment and you can come and take it, you know, um, and I don't even like it just. There's no clear there's no clear. Safe zone. Um, and it's looking increasingly like this might be the best we get. Um, so hold down the fort and build a citadel. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think the U.S. is still going to be the center of this. Shockingly, um, they could screw it up. Like obviously, it can be screwed up very easily and very quickly. Um, two months from now, I could be like, "Wow, what a dumbass guy was on the podcast." <laughs> um, but uh, right now, I have hope. That leads me, I guess, to my last question question before the wrap up. So I guess. While things can be scary, uncertain, and unknown, you know, FUD, typical uh, mm -hmm. acronym for it, fear, uncertainty, mm -hmm. and doubt. I guess, what are some reasons for optimism and hope with Bitcoin and specifically in the United States where we reside? Um, most of the politicians are incompetent. Fair enough. <laughs> that is a reason to be hopeful. Um, and because Bitcoin is moving forward with or without them. Um, like, we don't need approval. Uh, and in fact, some explicit disapproval is useful, is how Bitcoin is made strong. It's how the ecosystem is made strong. It's how the people are made strong. And, you know, people like everybody always talks about like, oh, Bitcoin doesn't need the Matt Odell's and the, the Bitcoin maximalists and the, the Michael Saylor's and the, you know, whatever. But like Bitcoin doesn't need the people around it. And I disagree in a sense. I'll say the reason Bitcoin doesn't quote unquote need them as individuals is because Bitcoin's nature is to create them. But Bitcoin, we need Bitcoin's nature to create them and we need that ecosystem and those people around it defending it because that is the defense. There is a social layer to this thing that needs to hold the ground. Um, and the meme war is real. And memes matter. That when Senator Warren makes a tweet like that, um, like like blasting Bitcoin, and then it's just a freaking ocean, just like just like she was strapped up in the middle of a square, and people threw tomatoes and onions and just garbage at her for like an hour. Just that thread of this is how stupid you are. This is what you look like. Of just calling them on their bullshit is an important part of this fight. Even the toxic idiots who come in and they have no idea what they're talking about, but they just join in on the battle. Um, it matters. It matters that people understand what kind of pushback and how devoted people are to this. Um, and we don't need anybody individually. I could be gone tomorrow and Bitcoin doesn't give a shit, right? Like it doesn't care yeah. about any one of us because it will create another one of us in our place. Yeah. Um, like as it continues to be that solid rock, um, it, it will, it teaches people when people ask questions and look into Bitcoin, it teaches them about that sovereignty, about the monetary system and the problems that we have. And because of that, Bitcoin will get the people that it needs. Um, it does it on its own and, um, uh, you know, when countries or regulations or whatever become unfriendly, well, that just means that we build it more robustly. We tools have to be built that specifically get around them, specifically can ignore them. Um, like it's anti-fragile, right? An anti-fragile thing in a non-competitive environment, in a, in a stress-free environment actually stagnates, actually gets weaker. It thrives on being contested. It thrives on being attacked. Bitcoin is anti-fragile. It will get stronger. It will get better. It will create more devoted Bitcoiners. The more obvious and illegitimate 
the government is and the more uh the more obviously corrupt and just completely full of crap they are and the more obvious their monetary policies and their macroeconomics are producing exactly the destructive consequences that we say it will only harden everyone in the idea that they are useless that they are actually a net destroyer of everything that is happening and it will push people further into bitcoin it will push bitcoiners further down the rabbit hole and further into why are we even listening to these people um and uh they will appear, appear less and less legitimate and even if it has to happen completely under the radar you know the soviet union collapsed because the legacy economy stopped producing and the the um the dominant economy the most productive economy was the black market like yeah it became it became more important to be a participant in the black market than in the legacy market so even if it gets pushed into the shadows bitcoin is decentralized enough and people are building every damn solution to every damn problem and if it means we have to refocus and we have to drop this fun feature for this more robust more decentralized base or fundamental part of the you know privacy of the lightning network or whatever it is well then we have to do that that's okay um we will adjust we will keep going and bitcoiners will pick up and move wherever the hell they need to move um, yeah. and this isn't going anywhere and we aren't stopping the internet didn't stop like you put a middle finger to the copyright industry and just keep building yeah that's awesome thank you for that response guy all right so i got three quick questions for you and then we'll wrap it up yeah. so i guess it's been a pleasure Can having I give you on. a quick answer that's the question yeah <laughs> that's a better question well i guess um it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the amateur investor so i guess we have some quick questions for you what's been your biggest investment or business mistake and I, 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 I tell Bitcoiners, they're not to say they didn't buy it soon enough or sooner. Uh, that's a uh, cop out. Um, does losing keys count? Um, uh, probably, I, okay. For just general investing is I had, the, like, I had a lot of conviction and I even had a little bit of money, but I was kind of in that place where, oh, it's not enough money to matter, but it would have mattered. Um, was when I was in college, just before even Bitcoin was around, um, uh, I had an opportunity uh, and my a good friend of mine who had like $5,000 to invest, like he was my roommate at the time, um, I was desperately trying to convince him to do it. And I should have just put $50 in. I should put $100 in anything. I could have done that uh, into Apple Okay. when uh, Steve Jobs died. Um, the stock plummeted. For like a hot minute mm -hmm. and uh for like you know a week or something like that um and then started to recover uh and when it dipped i was already in that mindset like you said of uh oh my god it's on sale um and uh you know the iphone was still new like you know like like everything like apple just felt like it was just getting going and it was like what's the price of apple now do you know right now yeah uh, I think it's been, had a bunch of stock splits, so it's like hard to. That's the thing. That's the thing is that it's, it's 170, like, but it's stock split so many times since he but died. There's that... like four or five stock splits. Yeah. Um, so, well, and... I guess what what year did you put it in, or about what what year was that when he uh, died? 2005, right? 2005. Yeah. So, that's so when it would, it's that's adjusted. When it would have it's been. it's adjust, adjusted on the stock chart. It would have been a dollar 63. So it would been it would have 100 x basically. Yeah. Yeah. I could have put in a hundred dollars and turned it into 10,000, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it is a hundred. And they, they, that's the good thing about the charts. They adjust it for the, the, the things, but yeah, a dollar 65 yeah. equivalent basically back then. Yeah. So that's, that's a mistake I made and I would have had, I would have actually had a little bit of money to put into Bitcoin when I got excited about Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, that would have made me far better position today. So. Yeah. All right. That's good to know. I like that answer. I guess, what's your favorite book, podcast, YouTube channel, or website that you like to go to for Bitcoin advice or in, in, uh, Bitcoin information, basically? Ooh, that's really... I give I give a laundry list because some people like to list them yeah. all. I'm like, you can just give one or if you can give multiple. So I, I leave it up to you. My thing is I usually go for conversations that I want to listen okay. to. And I have like this huge span. Like I listen to Stefan, Tales from the Crypt. Um, I just listened yesterday while I was 
doing Christmas presents. I was listening to Bit Refill with John Carvalho. Yeah. Um, I like, uh, even though they talk about DeFi too much, uh, I still really like uh, the Castle Island Ventures one, On the Brink. Yeah. Um, uh, I like, uh, uh, oh, there's so many. Um, I'll, I'll stop there because I could come up with a list of like 20 or 30 that I just kind of have in my subscriptions. And I download every episode, but I only just listen to one every yeah three weeks of each you know all right uh so thank you so much again for your time guy i guess if someone wants to learn more about you your business or anywhere to find you if you want to list your uh plug your your business or your uh twitter tags or anything like that sure sure i'm on twitter at the guy swan swan with two n's because it's better than the bird um and uh bitcoin audible is the show um you can't really find me by the business right now 111 uh, 111 productions uh, but we have hopefully a lot of stuff happening on that front um and some kind of refresh redesign stuff happening but right now it, everything that i announce or everything that i do will go through bitcoin audible um mm -hmm. like i'll probably do an episode on it and just like talk about what the plans are um at some point so just follow follow me on twitter and uh subscribe to bitcoin audible and you'll stay up on all of it sounds good thanks everyone Catch you on the next week's episode. Have a good one. Peace. Yep. Later.